sharing it throughout this webinar. We really appreciate um, your time. So today uh, we are meeting partners um, who have been spearheading uh, the ambitious goal of adding 100,000 electric buses worldwide in 20 focus cities while also influencing um, other cities to consider clean bus technologies. We'll be sharing lessons learned from two of those places, Salvador, Brazil, and Jakarta, Indonesia, to eliminate their unique challenges and opportunities that other cities can learn from. And we also have a very amazing panel with us today. Uh, we'll first start with Aimé Gauthier, the Chief Knowledge Officer at ITDP, who is overlooking the EBUS work um, that the organization is doing. And MA is also spearheading partner uh, relationships. MA will, will moderate the session. Then we'll pass it to, <laughs> to the speakers. First, first, we'll hear from Rohan Modi, who is an advisor at GIZ. He's working on procuring the 100,000 e-buses in partner cities by 2025. He will share a bit more about the objectives of the To Me eBus e mission project. Next, we'll hear from Vinencia Nanoi, a public transport and electrification specialist at ITDP Indonesia. Vinencia um, have been involved in the TransJakarta eBus work and will share about uh, some aspects of this uh, project like monitoring and evaluation activities and key recommendations for scaling up. And finally, uh, we welcome Diogo Ferreira. Uh, Diogo is an advisor to the Secretariat of Mobility um, of Salvador, Brazil. He will talk about the unique challenges um, that the city has been grappling with um, in developing its bus, e bus pilot and specifically highlighting the cross sector collaboration in overcoming some of those uh, perceived hurdles. So with that, I think it's time to open the formal presentations and welcome the panel. And I'll first welcome Emma to give us a bit, a bit of a background. Great, thank you so much, Ivana. And I'm really excited to be here to, on this heading towards 100,000 scaling electric bus fleets conversation. It's a really important conversation. Um, ITDP has been working for many years on electrification in buses. Um, and also we just concluded in partnership with Tumi, the phase one of the Tumi eBus um, mission. And so it's a really nice moment to reflect on what we've uh, learned over the past couple of years and what that means for the years going forward. So it's a really nice inflection point to be having this conversation. And I'm really excited to have this conversation with all y'all, um, but also especially with the panelists here. Um, as everyone is aware, we are in the midst of climate change. And so it seems to be happening faster than we had even anticipated. Um, and thus it's even more important that we are moving faster than ever. And that's what we're here to talk about. How do we scale our electric buses and how do we scale them quickly? Um, ITDP comes at electrification through the framework um, of global um, compact cities scenario electrified report that we did, which did some, which looked at the modeling showed that in order for us to reach our climate change goals, we need both an electrification strategy and a compact cities uh, strategy. And compact cities is walking, cycling, public transport, and dense um, integrated land use. So we need both of those. And not only is, is that just to reach our climate change goals, it's because each strategy makes the other one stronger and more successful. So they're mutually supportive. Um, they make each one more successful and it's how we're gonna reach climate change. Um, and I think for us at ITDP, we've been focusing on or prioritizing electrification for shared modes. So that's meant public transport, that's meant buses. Um, and so that's what the Tumi project has been doing. And it's one of the few projects that really looks at electrification at a breadth of you know many different cities, many different countries and at scale. So I'm really excited to have Rohan here talk about that project um, and, and see what the lessons learned are and see what the future is uh, for this project um, as we move into phase two. And then we'll also hear, as Ivona said, from these two amazing cities who have actually done the work um, and you know have the gray hairs to show from what happens when you, when you implement e-buses. Um, and so this is really setting the table so we can have a really good discussion that includes you all um, on what what do we need to be doing to really get electrification of buses more um, happening faster, quicker, um, so that we can really address the climate change um, issues. But 
But the other cool thing about electrification and e-buses is it's also a chance to think about equity. And so I just wanted to raise that in the opening. Um, we need to make sure that as we're going through this, we're thinking about just transitions. We're thinking about what what can electric buses do to, to help us meet our equity goals too. So um, in Brazil, they just released this report and I really liked how they framed it, that implementing e-buses is essentially implementing a new form of public transport. And I hadn't ever thought of it like that. So I think this is a really interesting way for us to start the conversation. It's about new vehicle technology. It's about new fueling systems. It's about impacts on operations. It's about new business models. All of these things you're gonna hear about from the panelists coming up about how they've had to adapt to this new system of public transport. But with this new system, there is an opportunity to rethink urban mobility as a whole. There are challenges when you introduce new systems and then taking them to scale, but there are really amazing opportunities. And so I think one of the opportunities is how do we break some of these systemic barriers that we've baked into our public transport systems that e-buses might be able to help us course correct. So with that, <laughs> I'm gonna hand it over to Rohan um, and I'm really excited for this conversation. Thank you all for being here. And Rohan, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, hi, everyone. Maybe uh, thanks, Amy, for setting the floor. And uh, I'll quickly maybe uh, try to go through uh, what To Me eBus mission is all about, and maybe um, yeah, share some uh, overarching learnings and the challenges which we learned so far, and a quick uh, uh, update on how we aim to proceed um in the second phase so with that i assume you you see my screen perfect okay mm -hmm. um yeah i think so uh why to me ebus mission so we are, we are quite aware that today the world emits over eight gigatons of co2 emissions annually and uh, which accounts for over 24% of the global CO2 emissions. And if we keep on going by this pace, uh, I think we will be consuming um, the whole of the transport uh, carbon budget for 1.5 degree pathway. Uh, that is with, uh, 110 gigatons CO2 between 2020 to 2050 within a decade. And- uh, yeah. May I ask you to ma maximize your window? Here it is. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, considering this, uh, um, we um facing some challenges here. I'm able to move my screen. Yeah. The window is visible. It works fine. Mm -hmm. I think your audio okay. is a little bit, uh, your audio only is a little bit uh, choppy. Great. Okay. So uh, recognizing the urgent need uh, for reducing the um, emissions, CO2 emissions from the urban passenger transport, uh, the project to me eBus mission was launched in 2019 as uh, one of the main four components at uh, uh, the climate, climate Action Summit under the ACT initiative, which was organized by United Nations Secretary General. And uh, the project aims uh, to support a, a policy dialogue with governments and cities, uh, fostering an enabling environment for over 20 deep dive cities uh, for the mass rollout of electric buses. Eventually, the project set itself a target of around um, 100,000 electric buses um, to be procured in um, the Global South by 2025. The mission is being implemented by seven organizations supported by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. It also showcases how the targeted approaches to multi-level or uh, multi-stakeholder engagements and synergies uh, uh, which are needed to advance progress towards the transport decarbonization. So the project uh, works mainly in three pillars. That is firstly, the project of course works towards providing a comprehensive technical assistance for the 20 deep dive cities. Um, for the development of e-bus roadmaps and also 
for the achievement of this roadmaps. Secondly, the mission also works towards uh, uh, developing a network of 100 cities by 2025 uh, with the primary aim to inspire these cities by providing them uh, access to global knowledge hub on the topic of e-buses, e-bus projects, facilitating peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, and also organizing you know, market and finance dialogues uh, for, uh, for these cities, wherein the main aim is to bring uh, financing institutions, also the private sector, uh, from different regions uh, uh, to all the cities uh, in which we are working. And finally, the uh, mission works uh, um, uh, under the pillar of global uh, coalition, wherein uh, we as project uh, um, get in touch with high level industry leaders, also some other initiatives and in the projects which are working into the sector to push ahead the topic of e buses at a global level. Um, the primary approach with which the project is working is, I would say, a 3i approach, wherein we are working to, you know, kind of implement targeted interventions in our partner cities together with our partners. Um, we are working towards institutionalizing these interventions. For example, we are forming uh, coalitions at city or regional level to um, uh, institutionalize uh, um, some approaches or some targeted interventions. And finally, we work to inspire the cities to follow the suit that is uh, with our second pillar that is the network cities pillar. Um, on the screen, you see a big graph. So it primarily shows uh, um, uh, we are currently operating in around 20 deep dive cities, which are marked in blue. And we are also actively engaging uh, with our network cities, which are around 63 at the moment. Um, and we are working to uh, develop this network to around 100 cities as we move forward in the second phase. So what did we achieve so far um, until April, uh, until March uh, 2023? Um, I would say the project under this project, we have actively engaged with our, uh, with over 74 cities. We have 50 plus events and it's not just events. I would say we also uh, in the 20 deep dive cities, uh, uh, all the partners uh, are uh, uh, working uh, together at the same table with uh, these city transit agencies or uh, the relevant partners in these cities. And um, so far we have uh, already supported procurement efforts of around 16,900 uh, buses in the phase one. And um, of course, during this phase one, we, uh, we, we came across several challenges which uh, um, to upscale these projects and some, some of the key challenges, which uh, I would say uh, under the project we see is under financing and supply chain uh, pillar. Then the second most important challenge which we see is optimizing project operations right from the uh, pilot project level so that you know it increases if you are if your project operations are optimized then it definitely increases the confidence uh, beyond the pilot for the cities and of course capacity building which is not just uh, relevant for the city transit agencies or uh, city authorities but also private sector in in some of the uh, in some of the regions in which we are working so yeah, I think rather these would be some of the, um, also I would say broad questions which I would like uh, uh, to hear and also encourage the other speakers to speak upon, uh, for example, on how could we make an encouraging ecosystem to support the private sector to push this um, agenda of e-buses ahead. How could we also raise the confidence uh, of uh, um, cities by uh, bringing in uh, timely digitization interventions, and finally, how could we address the targeted training needs of the cities and uh, private sector? Um, with this, uh, I would end and thank you very much for this opportunity. And also, maybe I would like to now pass it on to uh, Venencia from ITDP. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rohan. Uh, so, 
Hi everyone, this is Pinantia from uh, ITDP Indonesia office. So today I will present uh, about the case study of um, electric bus implementation in Jakarta. So uh, for all of you that may be not very familiar about Jakarta, so um, Jakarta is the largest city in Indonesia and also uh, in ASEAN. With the current population, it's about uh, 10.5 million. So currently, this city is uh, served by uh, different modes of public transport. So we have road-based public transport that called Transjakarta, and also we have uh, se several rail-based public transport. However, uh, the public transport mode share in Jakarta is still low, uh, below 10%. So um, in today's presentation, I will focus on uh, explain about uh, Transjakarta electrification program. So as I mentioned before, uh, Transjakarta is the BRT system in uh, Jakarta that um, already operated since um, 24, uh, 2004, sorry. And uh, currently this is the longest uh, BRT system in the world. So um, it serves uh, 13 main corridors and span about uh, 250 kilometers uh, across uh, the province. So uh, it has, um, seven different type of services, as you can see here, uh, that's mainly serve uh, 12 meter fleet and uh, seven meter fleet. So uh, Transjakarta already achieved uh, 1 million passengers right before COVID in February, 2022. And um, last June, uh, 2023, uh, it's also, um, yeah, get the peak uh, ridership about uh, 1 million. So, uh, Currently, uh, the Jakarta government, they have commitment for um, the electrification of uh, Transjakarta. So it has been started in 2019 when the Jakarta government signed an agreement uh, with C40 uh, to develop a climate action plan. And then uh, from this agreement, there are uh, several policy framework that has been issued by Jakarta government. Uh, the latest one, it's government of Jakarta degree uh, 1053, um, ITDP also helped the Jakarta government to develop this uh, policy framework. And based on this uh, policy framework, uh, the, J the government of Jakarta, they aim to achieve 50% uh, 50 50 of electrification of Transjakarta by 2027, and then 100% of electrification of uh, Transjakarta service by 2030, which is around uh, 10,000 e buses. So um, this is the current progress of Transjakarta. So it has been started since 2020. So they have a, like a pre-trial with a two e-buses just to see the performance of uh, electric bus in Jakarta. And then um, in 2021, uh, they focus on the procurement uh, stage. And then uh, starting in 2022, uh, the selected operators, they already built um, the charging infrastructure and then um, started to uh, operate the pilot uh, e-buses, start with four e-buses in March 2022. And then in June 2022, uh, they operate all of uh, these 30 e-buses. Uh, last August, uh, they already operate 22 additional e-buses. So now uh, there are 52 e-buses in uh, Jakarta. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, they use 12 meter uh, e-buses uh, operate by one operator and Jakarta, uh, Transjakarta also have a plan to operate uh, 48 e-buses by the end of uh, this year. So yeah, maybe, at the end of this year, um, Transjakarta will operate uh, 100 e-buses. So uh, under the TUMI program that Rohan mentioned before, uh, we did a monitoring of, and evaluation of Transjakarta e-buses. So here, uh, there are four indicators that we have been used for um, the monitoring and evaluation process. The first one is the vehicle performance. And then the second one is operating performance. The third one is uh, the environmental impacts. And then we also um, include the social and gender impacts during the monitoring and evaluation process. Here, as you can see, um, there are several findings that um, important to know, for example, like average energy consumption that we find 
during this monitoring and evaluation process, it's a uh, one kilowatt hour per kilometer, and the average travel distance is uh, 233 kilometer per day. Uh, just to point out here, uh, this is based on uh, the operational data for 30 e-buses that we collect uh, the data between March 2022 to uh, April 2023. So uh, yeah, we also did a social and uh, gender impact assessment. So ITDP Indonesia has conducted number of collaborative works with uh, vulnerable groups, uh, including survey, FGD, and audits to understand uh, more about their needs. Uh, specifically, um, in related to Transjakarta e-buses, we also uh, did the audits of for um, the design of uh, electric bus uh, in Transjakarta. So um, last, we also conducted the training need assessment survey during uh, this monitoring and evaluation uh, process. So we know uh, what is uh, the training that needs um, to yeah to improve for uh, support supporting uh, Transjakarta um, operation. I mean Transjakarta e bus operation. So here, uh, there are several challenges that we face um, during uh, this monitoring and evaluation. Um, yeah, monitoring and evaluation of Transjakarta e buses. So um, we categorize into four uh, different aspects. The first one is the policy challenge. So uh, there is an absence of clear and strong regulation to support uh, e bus adoption in Jakarta. And then the second one related to uh, the financial challenge. So as you know that uh, the e-bus require like a high upfront cost. So uh, with the current business model, uh, we face uh, the challenge for the operator to um, yeah, to procure the electric bus and operate uh, these buses. And then there is an operational challenge such as like insufficient knowledge to operate this new technology. And uh, the latest one, it's related to monitoring and evaluation challenge, like a lack of data collection and uh, verific data verification. So here, um, yeah, we propose several recommendation. Yeah, it's uh, from the policy aspect, like we need the strong regulatory framework from Jakarta government, as well as from uh, the national government also to support uh, the adoption of electric buses at the large scale in Jakarta uh, as well as in the national level and then uh, the financing aspect. So um, yeah, I will present more uh, related to like um, business model that we recommend for Transjakarta to accelerate uh, their uh, Transjakarta electric bus program. And then uh, we also uh, propose the recommendation for operational uh, planning and preparation, for example, like a charging optimization or uh, provide more support for um, electric bus operators, like the training that uh, need to be done by Transjakarta of, uh, or the transportation agency. So, and the last one, it's related to monitoring and evaluation, like, um, the need of data collection and sharing mechanism, and then the upgrade of um, the eBus control cent center and uh, the build the capacity. So here, um, under the different uh, under the UCAPAC program, we also uh, work in Transjakarta uh, to assess the Transjakarta electrification target. So here, this is the total investment that need to um, electrify all of 100% uh, of Transjakarta fleet by 2030. So uh, we need um, about maybe 1.43 billion USD to uh, electrify uh, around 10,000 units of uh, Transjakarta fleets. And here, um, yeah, uh, under this study, we also propose uh, the possible commercial arrangement like um, the several business models. So we assess the first one is like uh, by the service, which is the current uh, business model in Transjakarta. And then uh, we also um, assess the option two for the concession model. And then uh, the third one, the fleet uh, leasing. The third one is the combination scenario, as you can see here. Um, so um, yeah, we split the, what is it, like the risk, um, the financial risk uh, from here. For example, the business, as you can see in the current uh, business model, 
like the bus operator have a lot of risk here, like they have the ownership of the fleet and then operation and then the maintenance, but then, um, and they also need to um, procure the charging infrastructure. So um, here in the business model that we assess, uh, we split this uh, responsible to um, other parties. Um, yeah, as you can see here, uh, this option two, it has, uh, what is it, the delta within uh, the, the, yeah, the highest delta with the, uh, bis the, the current uh, business model. So um, yeah, the option two and option four, it's the highly recommended to uh, implement for uh, Transjakarta. And then here we also um, an analyze the finding scheme. So uh, we assess the uh, financing source from the public sector and also uh, the private sector. So uh, so the highlights of this study here, uh, we need like um, utilizing the finding instrument and the involvement of private fi financing company uh, provide a higher cost of funds, but can it can provide a higher uh, financing flexibility. Uh, the important one, another important thing uh, to mention is the national government has an important role uh, for providing guarantee to reduce the cost of fund and uh, smoothen uh, the access to finance. So um, just to give a summary uh, regarding to um, what we have done in Jakarta. So um, a strong regulatory framework is needed to provide a legal basis for uh, TransJakarta to implement the e-buses at a large scale. And then a long-term uh, business model, it's needed uh, for e-bus procurement as well as for uh, charging uh, infrastructure procurement of, on operation. And the third one, um, technical support also, it's needed for e-bus operation and uh, charging infrastructure. And the latest one, it's uh, the detailed monitoring and evaluation scheme. It's also uh, needed to ensure uh, the smooth transition to uh, eBus implementation. So here, um, yeah, I will point out this uh, available resources that uh, I used in um, this slide. So here, um, this is the TUMI uh, report that we that we have done for the monitoring and evaluation eBuses. And here, um, this is um, mainly for the business case for uh, Transjakarta eBus deployment. And then uh, the latest one, we compile all of uh, our uh, electric bus study in um, like an easy read uh, document that will be published soon in uh, this October. So yeah, thank you everyone. And I will pass to Diogo to uh, present this case study of uh, Salvador. Thank you. Thank you, Venezia. I will speak in Portuguese. I will try to do my best to get slowly. Uh, share my screen here. You might be seeing my screen by now. And let me put the presentation. All right. You might be seeing my screen, right? Okay. Uh, bom pessoal. Uh, bom... Well, turning to Portuguese now, my name is Diogo Ferreira. I work uh, on the implementation of the mobility plan for the uh, city hall of Salvador in the northeast of Brazil. So I'll just uh, speak a little bit to start with about the city of Salvador so that you can understand what kind of city we're talking about. It's one of the densest cities in Brazil and among the densest cities in the world. And that makes it even more challenging for us to think about mobility. And you also have to consider the geography of our city because we have some challenges where there is a difference in altitude of nearly 100 cities with 100 meters within the city. And that's uh, that funny concept of being far and close at the same time. You're talking about two venues, two areas that are physically close, but access from one to the other is not that direct. And despite this scenario, most of the population uh, move around using active modes of transportation. And this actually results from an effort that the city of Salvador makes towards maintaining a number of vertical uh, mobility uh, uh, pieces of equipment. So a number of different uh, uh, mechanisms that enable us to uh, uh, 
move around or enable citizens to move around without having to rely on motorized transport. So we have recently uh, reopened one of these elevators that enable people to move from one side of the city to another using perhaps their bike together with the elevator. And this is evidence of how uh, the city of Salvador has been uh, making efforts to expanding, for example, our uh, cycling network, and we aim to reach 700 kilometers in the next few years. And we also have uh, interoperability and a highly integrated transport system. We have three types of e-fares, uh, and all these three e-cards or e-transport cards, they uh, can be used for all different modes of transportation in the city. So uh, you can use uh, uh, the subway or the metropolitan uh, train system or the BRT system, and you can use actually the same card for uh, uh, the, the shared uh, bicycle uh, system. Uh, and these are a number of different actions that are being put in practice and are included in our sustainable mobility uh, plan. Uh, we call these plans the Plan Mob Salvador which since it was launched, actually it has uh, led to a number of different documents that were published subsequently that talk about different aspects of mobility and that include, of course, electrifying our fleet. So we believe that this mobility plan was the first seed that actually uh, generated a number of different branches uh, in the form of different studies. And along this timeline, we have a number of different studies related to people's health and the use of uh, electric uh, mobility and uh, climate change. Uh, there's a, a specific publication on climate change related to mobility. We've run different tests with uh, e-buses, you know, economic aspects and operational aspects as well. So this mobility plan, you know, back then talked about or designed these are transport corridors uh, for VLTs and uh, and BRTs, and then we developed between 2019 and 2020 an operational plan, and we started calling it uh, POP 2020. And basically, it uh, detailed this integrated network of uh, subway, BRT, and light rail vehicles, and the adoption of uh, electric uh, buses and electric vehicles as a whole. So we did all that. And behind, you know, this uh, grid of different lines and different uh, routes, we have a full infrastructure of uh, charging uh, structures and, uh, and bus uh, depots, etc. So we see all this material and we feel, you know, it was a very uh, deep and very detailed study, but when we actually started reviewing it with our colleagues, not only uh, government operators, but also private operators involved in the system and other people in our team, uh, often we saw that uh, people still could not believe that that was a reality. So there were situations where I could say, for example, that people did not take that seriously. And little by little, that was that started being developed, and we had to overcome a number of challenges or a number of myths, because, uh, uh, for example, when we talked about e-buses, um, some people believed well, e-buses cannot, you know, uh, drive uh, uh, up a hill, and you know, so there were a number of uh, challenges related to uh, uh, this demystifying these ideas that you know uh, that the autonomy would not be sufficient and they wouldn't have enough power, etc. And adding to that, we had to face all the challenges related to the pandemic, which was very challenging for all of us. And actually, one of our operators in the city of Salvador actually went bankrupt, and we had to support this operator because you know, as a result of the pandemic, they did not have enough revenue to keep operating, and. That's how we reached the TUMI uh, uh, mission. And we started working more closely together with different partners. And we ran new tests with e-buses. And through these tests, we started trying to debunk uh, these different uh, myths. And in, uh, in the real world, we realized you know, that actually they were not real. You know, We just looked around and say, you know, people say that they don't have enough power to uh, drive up a hill. 
but in fact, they're a lot more efficient, for example, than diesel buses. So we started deconstructing all those myths. And this also resulted from strategic alignment uh, involving our team of, uh, you know, at the Mobility Secretariat, uh, our team of officials and different private operators, and also with the support from the TUMI uh, initiative in Brazil. And uh, the Brazil office uh, has been working with us on a number of different uh, projects in so so we, we developed a timeline where we could consider you know different aspects such as uh, risk mitigation challenges and opportunities that we might face and also with support from a c40 we held a number of different workshops focused on that and uh, we managed to uh, hold these bilateral uh, meetings where transport operators could actually have their private meetings so they'll have like a general discussion and then to start with you know involving everyone and then uh, at a separate part you know we had these breakout sessions where uh, transport operators could actually sit around the table for private meetings with suppliers and uh, different brands and 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 the, the market the, the market of uh, producers and manufacturers you know what they could provide in terms of technology technology and equipment and we uh, were supported by our mobility uh, secretary and we developed a program of weekly meetings and uh, that resulted in a spreadsheet with different uh, activities different actions and every week we met to align our activities and to try to build this project together so basically that's how our work started and of course we relied a lot or we in a way we piggybacked on our brt uh, system uh, and it's a uh, it's a system that provides let's say more comfort to our passengers but we were able to add actually this electrification to uh, our brt system so we compared what we did with the uh, conventional uh, bus transport in the city of Salvador. So for example, uh, what people used to take 45 minutes to cross, you know, with traditional buses, now with the BRT, they can cover the same distance in 16 minutes only. And basically what we did is that we uh, added electrification to that and we built the first uh, charging infrastructure near the station, which is the main trunk or the main hub uh, along this line. So we created these 10 uh, charging units of 160 kilowatts an hour. And that enabled us uh, to uh, recharge these vehicles very quickly. And our expectation or estimate is that we could recharge about 40 buses uh, uh, at this terminal. And uh, the support that we received from the city hall for this process was very important because we had this challenge of uh, implementing electric uh, mobility. And one of the main challenges was the need for very uh, high initial uh, investment or these upfront costs. And the city of Salvador helped us to build this very robust infrastructure. And that helped to attract operators to try to understand a bit better how this operation could actually become a reality within the BRT uh, system. And we have, uh, We've had some interesting uh, results. So in the initial tests that we ran with uh, conventional buses, but uh, e-buses, not BRT, not uh, ex uh, dedicated corridors, we reached a level of uh, consumption of 1.2. So we expected, you know, to we decided to take a more conservative approach in terms of consumption. But actually, the reality was even better than what we expected. We are still a bit careful about sharing this information, but uh, our BRT uh, operation, you know, they we, we call them our diamond drivers, or say they're, they're top drivers. They understand very well how to operate the system. And actually, their consumption is even lower than what we expected. It's about one kilowatt hour per kilometer. So this is very interesting because uh, very little was said about, you know, 
economy for the batteries. And as a result of these tests, people are more uh, uh, trusting of this new technology. And uh, in terms of lessons learned, this is my last slide so that we can continue with our discussions. One of the lessons that we learned here in the city of Salvador, and I think it's one of the key points that was actually critical for this process, is that uh, the initiative helped us a lot, you know, uh, as uh, uh, a point of co uh, as a pivotal uh, uh, partner in this process. Uh, they enabled us to connect even further with different actors, uh, different stakeholders, suppliers, uh, manufacturers, and also operators. So I'd say that before, you know, up to a while ago, uh, we in Brazil, it was uh, like one against the other. It was like a, almost a football match or a soccer match where you have two teams, you know, one fighting against the other. But along this process, we managed to engage all these different actors and bring them closer together and develop a, a dialogue involving everyone and actually work in partnership. And I think this was a key aspect for our success. We planned the operation in detail. We believe that this is key for the process. We also uh, assess the technology and the charging infrastructure and we tried to reduce and mitigate as much as possible all the different myths that we had, all the different risks that we had as well. So we placed our charging structure near the terminal. So that enabled us uh, to, to turn the system uh, into something more attractive in terms of energy efficiency. And of course, mitigating these risks and having a contingency plan, something that we did together with the operators. So this is something that we, of course, we, when we talk about risk mitigation, we have to consider financing how to start, how to take the first step in this process. I'd say that the first step is the main challenge, but I'll stop here and I'll leave some time for us to discuss and uh, answer questions. And uh, I'll hand the floor back to Amen now so that uh, we can start our discussion answering questions. And I'm very eager to hear what you have to say about this. Thank you. Amazing. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Diogo and Venezia and Rohan. This has been really interesting and, and exciting to hear from from everyone um, so far. And I think I'm going to start with Rohan's kind of uh, uh, departure point, which is de-risking mechanisms, because I think Diogo's point is interesting. So I thought it might be um, a nice opening of the discussion. And then I'm gonna, there's a bunch of Q and A questions. So I'm really excited to see those there as well. So we'll jump into that as well. But first let's let let's talk about de-risking. Um, one of the big challenges with e-buses is that the kind of finances are inverted. Like previously with fossil fuel buses, you have um, your, your cost of the vehicle is much lower, but your operational costs are much higher. It, that gets reversed with e-buses where the, the cost of the vehicle is more, but the operations tend to be less. So I think, Diogo, you had talked about how the government helped mitigate some of that risk. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more for the operators, if you could talk a little bit more about that. And then, Venezia, if you could also talk about how um, the government and the operators are working together to de-risk the move, the move into uh, e-buses. So I'll pass to Diogo oh. first, and then we'll go to Venezia. All right. Uh, so, so actually, uh, I would say that first that uh, uh, or, or, or or the municipality actually prepared well uh, before everything. So we have done studies of the impacts of electromobility and so on. So we were actually, let's say, convinced already that uh, that's that's a, it's a goal zone. You, you must go for this direction. So, uh, uh, and and if you talk to the operators, they were saying like, uh, oh, you are you are asking me to change the whole operation that I already have. Uh, with the diesel, as, as a completely the logistics is completely different. So in the beginning, actually, we were talking about uh, night recharging through the night, right? And the operator, when when heard about that, it was like, a, "Wait, if I have to solve a problem during the night, it's it's harder than during the day, because sometimes it's uh, uh, the, you, you 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 have the logistics already prepared 
for your operations uh, and sometimes during the night can be challenging so in the beginning we're like a lack of understanding of oh the, the batteries must be recharged from the beginning until the end or can i recharge in the meantime i mean during the day so as as long as those myths let's say that this those, those challenges that we, they were like saying like no it's impossible because this this is not good because of this so we are let's say this Discon construction of those those myths and and, and and so on and we start to understand what actually let's say legitimately uh, can be actually challenging so we are talking to hit them to okay we are going to electric buses so we have to buy the bus the battery and the charging infrastructure and usually they have the garage that are actually strategically located but not actually in the line so the municipality start to understand like okay let's 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 assess this if if we really want this let's let's try to understand how can we give this first push let's say so we actually got a, a, a location for the first recharging infrastructure in the in the let's say it's just a 150 meters from the main station and we actually uh planned to get let's say uh, the double uh, double pistols chargers that if you can you can charge the two buses or one with a really high let's say uh, speed recharging speed so uh, and the operation starts the operators start to think think like oh so I don't need the the really heavy battery so I will have this on the corridor the, the, the recharging infrastructure inside the corridor and uh, I perhaps can charge on in, in, in between the peaks uh, the bus. And so that means that they don't have to go for the, the bus with a huge battery pack, that it's more weight and uh, more weight means less passengers. And so they start to, let's say, liking. OK, and, and so, so the municipality actually made this investment uh, on, on the recharging infrastructure. And, and so they, they let's say they, they bought the first fleet operatic buses and and so let's say for for a start uh, i think that it is it, it is needed in our, in our reality this first push to let's say uh, let's let's taste that Let, let's see how it works so this would be the experience of the city of Salvador on this context great thank you Francia, do you want to add anything uh yeah and so in terms of Jakarta cases um yeah um in my presentation before uh the trans Jakarta started to post like uh, the bid for uh the e-bus procurement in March uh 2021 and then um it takes uh around like four or five months to um uh, appoint the selected operator so um after the selection of the operators, so Transjakarta and uh, the selected operators, they have discussed regarding uh, the gross cost contract mechanism and then uh, what kind of the responsible, responsible that uh, goes to Transjakarta and then uh, for this um, EBUS operator. And then, uh, yeah, uh, they also... Um, for Transjakarta cases, uh, the current uh, e-bus pilot, it's only use the overnight charging. So uh, Transjakarta, because this is a pilot, so uh, they also um, like try and uh, try this uh, e-bus pilot in uh, several roads. So they need to see uh, the performance of the e-buses and then uh, just to, what is it like, just to align the um the the current uh, charging scenario uh, which is the only uh, the overnight uh, charging scenario um with the the what's it the road selection for the ebus pilot so yeah there are like a lot of discussion before the implementation of uh this uh, pilot ebuses as you can see like uh, they start the bidding in 2021 but then uh the operation it's in march uh, 2022 so it takes like uh, uh, around one year to um yeah discuss this process yeah thank you great and Rohan feel free to jump in yeah maybe very quickly to uh, add upon this uh, um so we, when we talk about scale uh, I mean scale and pace of the scale is equally important uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And we already uh, heard from Diogo and also Venencia regarding, uh, you know, policy frameworks. Both both of them spoke about uh, something related to policy. I uh, remember Venencia's presentation mentioned about uh, 
smoothening uh, the sector is also responsibility of government. So until the government uh, comes in uh, with appropriate regulatory framework, which gives confidence, not just to the private sector, but also to uh, the financing institutions. Because if we go and just check uh, the uh, finance readiness matrix of the financing institutions, the national or the local state level policy frameworks of that particular sector for our case eBus is uh, very much on the top list. So uh, mm -hmm. these policies need to be addressed uh, uh, on how to uh, bring in the confidence of private sector is, uh, is very important. Secondly, we are seeing very much uh, uh, the case uh, uh, from Latin America to uh, you know Africa as well as in Asia now uh, the private sector uh, companies are coming in and playing a major role or they are leading this electrification journey um, and in some regions uh, uh, the balance sheet of this private sector companies are highly leveraged you know because primarily uh, they have even taken private sector has also taken lead in regions or countries where there were not so good or encouraging public sector policies or frameworks when it comes to tariffs and other things so um, now is the time the uh, private sector is also taking a back step because they cannot uh, over leverage their balance sheets with more projects and that's the time you know we think uh, governments need to step in to bring in a uh, national level or at least a regional level within a nation uh, um, uh, de-risking mechanisms which could be worked upon together with uh, multilateral uh, uh, institutes but also even uh, some other um, um, financing institutes uh, um, to, uh, to, to develop some funds, uh, maybe guarantee funds for these projects so that uh, uh, private sector is now even encouraged to uh, come in and scale up uh, um, with, their, with their investments into the sector. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think all of the points that you have raised is, are, are good. I think this links to another question. Um, that was raised, which is around subsidies, um, which is how can you make this shift without increasing subsidies? Or I think the, the traditional model in many of our cities is that the fair revenue has to cover the total cost of operations. Um, I think ITDP views that as a fundamentally flawed business model <laughs> uh, for the operators because it puts all of the risk on them and it um, um, abdicates the government of their responsibilities. So this is a moment in time where we can redress some of that imbalance about who bears the full risk of, of this transition. And what's the role? There's the role of financing guarantees um, and making sure that the financing is available for, for, for these buses. But I think the other issue is thinking about, is this a, a way to rethink how we, we fund operations and support operators with, with meeting the service? So I'll just open that up to anyone who wants to. I, I would actually mention that uh, we also, I mean, we were just afterwards the pandemic impact. So in uh, as we have the system here that is actually main, maintained by the revenue, the ticket fare revenue, right? So it, it creates a, 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 a really, let's say, not attractive scenario for new investments and so on. So we have also the contracts as well that uh, we are already, let's say, is still valid, the contract. So we cannot change the rules of the contract on 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 let's say ongoing or so it's a it's a really challenging situation but uh once you let's say put let's say the, the cards on the table and say that okay this this is our goal that's what you're heading to and 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 you start to understanding what are the the the, the, the what are the advantages of, of going through this path so it's like trying to understand perhaps sometimes the 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 the, the, the possibilities that can can be enhanced on on the quality of life for the for the for the passengers to to attract more passengers so it's it's actually something like we i would say that we are kind of feeling here in salvador that it's like the or brt actually uh, are getting more passengers than the models that actually we 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 calibrated in the in the past so actually we have this challenging situation now of uh, managing uh, of of the success of the, of the system so this is it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a good problem right so it's like we are getting more passengers interested on our system so uh, it's it, it, it's it's not only about 
the electric buses. The electric buses are playing the role, but uh, there there are a, a, a group of factors that are involved in, on this on this on this matter. So I think that also that the operators are also also thinking about this uh, now. So it's like uh, some kind of uh, uh, let's let's play around and 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 bring this dialogue together to understand what can you explore further on on this on this matter. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so Amen, I want to add uh, in uh, Trans Jakarta cases, so we want to keep uh, the current uh, service. I mean, we don't want to increase um, the fare for uh, Trans Jakarta system, but how to attract, uh, like Rohan mentioned before, the private uh, investment to um, the procurement of uh, the electric buses system in Trans Jakarta. And then the second one, uh, we think that uh, government involvement is really needed here. For example, like the incentive for um, kind of incentive or policy regulatory framework that can uh, lower the high, yeah, the capital cost for e-bus procurement. So um, um, in the total cost of uh, ownership, the cal calculation of e-buses, it will, uh, like reduce the total TCO of e-buses. Mm -hmm. So uh, the government don't need to um, increase the subsidy for yeah for uh, the e-buses. And also uh, we want to like spread the financial risk not only for the operator, but then uh, how to attract uh, other private sector to invest in uh, this uh, e-bus program. Yeah, Ibis uh, procurement in Trans Jakarta, as um, yeah, as I already mentioned in uh, like different business scheme that we try to elaborate for um, support the Trans Jakarta Ibises. Great. Um. Cool. Uh. There's a that there's like a really active chat and a lot of questions. So, um, just because we're a little bit running out of time, I know we still have fifteen minutes, but um, uh, just. There's a really big discussion um, around how do you look at the benefits of electrification, um, especially looking at the grid and the source of your electricity. Um, so just uh, if you guys could talk a little bit about how you've approached that. Um, both Harry and Peter Midgley have been going back and forth on this. I think it's an interesting question that people are, are grappling with like for that. And then I think the other question I'm going to bundle in with this really quick is um, first and last mile connectivity issues and smaller vehicles. Um, there's a question of like, how do you get people to your BRT systems? Um, and are you thinking about that um, through the process of the projects that you're doing? And then um, maybe there's the, the opportunity to electrify some of those micro mobility modes. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, uh, and also smaller buses, like have you used smaller buses or that type of thing. So I'm going to throw that out to you guys. It's a wide net feel like responding to whatever you want. Thank you. I, I will try to, to respond about the, You said about the BRT, sorry, as uh, uh, the, the question about the BRT, how to attract people to the BRT is, is uh, this is because, yeah, because how, it's, does it, how do they get to the BRT system? Did you think about that when you were implementing the BRT system, like walking, cycling, smaller vehicles, smaller micro transit? Um, those types of things. Yeah, actually, I mean, uh, our, our BRT, the project itself, uh, it actually, we have the, 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 the let's say, integration with bikes, bikes uh, with uh, bicycle mm -hmm. lanes uh, all along the the, 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 the corridor. But uh, I, I think that one, one of the things that I think we, we, we just uh, got, got uh, really right on, on the inauguration was that we inaugurated the system and let's say overlapping the existing lines. So the existing line that I mentioned that was doing like a 45 minutes in the same uh, route. Uh, so people started looking like, oh, let, let me try that that thing, that new thing, whatever it is. Actually, it was the first BRT system of the city of Salvador. So people were like a little bit, let's say, concerned about it. So actually we operated for free one month. And, and in doing this operation, people... Uh, we had this, uh, we call posso ajudar, né? can I help? That, 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 that sign in, in the back. And, and, and it was really interesting because uh, those, those, let's say, everyone that was involved in the project from the operators, from the municipality, from, from the, the team that was working there on, in the station, they 
everyone was like uh, in love of the idea of uh, this new system and and everything what what that was being carried on so uh the involvement of them uh we we had a, a QR code inside the bus where people could uh, get the phone and, and put their their comments about it or their experience mm -hmm. we still have it actually we, we 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 intended to have this just for the inauguration and it's still there uh we are i mean we are already nine months of operations and and and, and um uh, we're still receiving comments uh in the beginning was like people saying like uh, wow i i was kind of scared in the beginning like how what is that thing that people are approaching me so People are so lovely with me. And it's, it's also something like from regionally here. Uh, Bahia is known, uh, the, the, the Salvador, the city of Salvador is in the state of Bahia. And the mm -hmm. state is known, let's say, in worldwide, I would say, not only in Brazil, but the people here are really, let's say, the reception here is like always a party or something. So uh, they are really, let's say, welcoming. And so uh, we, we, we saw the number of passengers increasing so much because I think that was also because of this, let's say, approach that uh, we are telling people what it is about uh, the electric buses. So people start to understand like, oh, this is, there's no noise at all. And, and it's, it's like, it's, it, we think that can be small things. Perhaps uh, when we say this, it's not, oh, it's not that important. But I mean, people are getting transit transportation every day to home and, and this is actually impacted their life. So this is actually, uh, they, they feel the difference. So uh, it's what's really interesting because we had this, let's say, overlapping uh, uh, situation, the beginning of the operation. So people could, let's say, taste a bit. And then we start looking at the lines that were actually getting empty buses. Uh, and so we started, let's say, organizing in this rationalization of the system. So uh, it was really interesting to see how the people actually reacted to, to, to this let's say new technology, uh, people that actually prefer that, uh, that, that they comment about it, they, they comment that, that they feel the differences. And, and, and this is really interesting because I think that is, is a way to push to, to uh, let a more sustainable uh, mobility. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And I think the role of communications is also, is often undervalued in terms of how do you get these systems operationalized. Venezia, do you want to add anything to the bevy of questions just asked? Yeah, uh, the first one that I want to answer, it's regarding to the electricity. I mean, um, in our um, IBA study in Transjakarta, so we always assess um, like um, the demand for the electricity that needed to uh, support this uh, electrification uh, target in Transjakarta. And then we also in uh, several studies, uh, we also assess like uh, how we can um, include the sol solar panel, for example, uh, as um, like a power, um, yeah, uh, the source of the electricity for Transjakarta, for example, like we install the solar uh, panel in the terminal uh, building mm -hmm. for uh, the charging at the terminal or at the depot. So, um, and then uh, regarding the demand itself. So uh, currently in Java, uh, where the Jak Jakarta is located, like the island that Jakarta located. So there is a surplus of electricity. So uh, this uh, Transjakarta electrification target uh, only has like a small impact on the uh, current, um, yeah, the electricity demand in uh, Jakarta. And then uh, to answer um, the second question that related to um, like integrated uh, this BRT system with other uh, sustainable uh, transport system. Here also we, um, in Jakarta, there, 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 there are a lot of improvement for the access for um, like non-motorized transport, like walking and cycling and also um, we are currently doing the bike sharing uh, system. I mean, uh, the assessment for uh, Jakarta government, so it can uh, support the BRT system. And then uh, Trans in Transjakarta system, actually they have uh, the four meter fleets that also uh, we, we call it micro trans. It's also under uh, the Transjakarta service. And this micro trans also will be included in, uh, already included in our study for, um, Transjakarta electrification program. Uh, the last one that I want to uh, echo Diogo uh, mentioned before uh, regarding the electric bus. 
uh, for example, like uh, there is no noise on the operation, but then uh, sometimes it can be a problem with uh, people with disabilities, for example, like uh, hearing loss. Uh, so we have uh, the, yeah, the discussion with uh, the people with disabilities community. So uh, we also propose the recommendation like uh, maybe um, in this, um, what is it? Um, in the split design, uh, they should have uh, like a visual one that can uh, give a sign or um, yeah, to give a sign for um, these people with disabilities. Like uh, we, we try to um, align uh, what is the new uh, thing that we find in uh, eBus operation that has been different for uh, the ICE uh, buses? And then uh, we we use this um, electrification tra target in Transjakarta also as a uh, momentum to uh, propose the inclusive uh, design, for example, for the eBus uh, fleet. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Farhan, do you want to add anything or do you want to ask yeah. a question? Yeah, maybe very quickly on your first question again on renewable energies. I think uh, uh, definitely there's, uh, I mean, this is uh, um, renewable energy is key to decarbonization um, in, in energy as well as in transport sector. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, we, um, in most of the countries where we are working uh, at the moment may not be having quite some renewable energy generation, but uh, the fact is we, we cannot wait for renewable energies to come up for us. It's, it's a simultaneous process which uh, uh, we, we need to take in both the sectors to decarbonize uh, 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 both the sectors, but also, uh, also uh, helping the country to achieve its net zero. Having said that, I think uh, there are a uh, few countries uh, like, uh, you know, Costa Rica, Kenya, uh, and a uh, few more where uh, electrification would be ideal uh, at, at the moment because they are highly renewable energy rich countries. But there are also some examples uh, like from uh, you know, a city of Mumbai where they are uh, already procuring renewable energy for operation of e-buses and that is made possible with some of the energy regulations which uh, like uh, uh, in India it is said uh, open access yeah so um, it's not just necessary to uh, have more um, renewable energy generation but also it's uh, at the moment need of the hour is also to have some enabling energy regulations which uh, which, which supports the procurement of renewable energy um, uh, apart from the local supplier to the electric bus projects or uh, the public transit projects. So um, this, yeah, that would be it. And I also saw one question maybe again on a solar panel, could solar panel be introduced on, uh, on, on the electric bus depots? So uh, maybe very quickly to add on to this as well, it's uh, uh, definitely having solar panels on roof uh, is uh, advantageous, but it's also uh, makes sense uh, uh, to do a detailed feasibility analysis. For example, I think C40 CFF is uh, doing a detailed again report uh, or, or a project, not a report on um, city of Mumbai uh, where they are uh, doing detailed feasibility of around 27 depots, uh, uh, electric bus depots are public transport reports uh, to analyze what is the potential of renewable energy generation on these. So uh, a prudent uh, uh, feasibility-based approach would be more uh, appropriate rather than just installing solar panels on the roof of the reports. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree. I think it's, it, it also, you're not sure what the impact on operations of the weight of the solar panels will also be on energy consumption too. So it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, and I do think that as we think about electrification, we do need to think about where the electricity is coming from. But at the same time, I think the the local health benefits um, are pretty significant. We are almost at time, y'all. So unfortunately, um, I would like to ask for closing remarks. Some of the things that people have brought up that I think are um, interesting um, that you can maybe comment on. Um, uh, Heather Allen raised the question of gender and what really um, is happening around um, gender integration and um, 
equity approaches through this process. And you can also talk more broadly about the just transition, um, the challenge of um, aligning stakeholders, uh, some of the things that you had raised for Han around data sharing and integration of dig digitalization. Um, there's, uh, let's see, <laughs> there's branding and, and communications as was raised. Um, and then also just more the technical things of like charging, uh, where does charging go? How do we adjust it? These are all very technical things. This is your moment to say your last thoughts, leave us with some inspiration, leave us with um, something that we can take away and, and apply to our own work. So I'm just gonna pass it over to you all. I'm gonna start with Venencia and then move around um, back to Rohan. Uh, yeah, Amy, thank you. So, um, yeah, from my side, um, the government target is really important to um, accelerate the bus, uh, the, the, the public transport uh, transition to electric buses. But here, uh, the important one, the government also need to, uh, the government support, it's really uh, needed here for from the regulatory framework as well as the financing aspect to accelerate uh, this financing and then uh, we can use this uh, e-bus transition as a momentum also to include the inclusive uh, yeah inclusivity uh, um, yeah, inclusivity uh, yeah for uh, improve the inclusivity in uh, public transport yeah thank you thank you Diego Uh -oh. <laughs> we, we might need to skip Jago. Jago first. All right. So Rohan, <laughs> yeah, we'll go thanks. to you. Um. Yeah. I, I think. Uh, um. RTE. Is, I think. Uh, am I hearing something? Okay. Oh. I heard. Yeah. So you about... froze for a minute. All right. We'll we'll go to Diogo and then to Rohan. Sorry, you froze, so we moved on. <laughs> but Sorry, please, Diogo, go I, ahead. Did I jump right? <laughs> Sorry. No, I was, was just about to mention, like, uh, uh, in our team, actually, when we start discussing about uh, electric buses, uh, we had this kind of, uh, I, I really go into this, is this real? It's like, it, it, it was something like, it seemed like unachievable. It's like, no, it's not, it's not for now. So, but but it is a reality, and and we now we, we are let's say tasting the 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 the, the uh, this this the, the advantage of of our of shifting this. And 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 one thing that uh, I mean I, I saw in the comments like people saying like uh, oh should put solar panels in the in the stations in the in the depots and 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 so actually uh, I mean the bus consumption is really higher than what we can generate at least in in a small area of uh, solar panels. But we are actually doing on our BRD stations putting solar panels. But the thing that I think that is more important to do this is to to be part of their lives. I mean people are seeing this. People are living this thing this is a, a reality already so what what was in the past like now this is a future uh, far away for now no we are actually leaving this and this transition is real so uh it, it's like getting aware that we are part of this this shift and 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 it's part of for the life so uh i would say like uh we need to to get more heads thinking about how can we move forward and and try to 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 get I mean, on track for a more sustainable future. And so this would be my final thoughts. That is like, like what our team, like we are working on. And we think that this is a, a good path to go. Great, thank you. Rahan? Yeah, maybe just connecting to what uh, Tioko mentioned that this transition is real. And uh, um, I think uh, it's a no-brainer in most of the regions. TC of e-buses are lower than the other fossil counterparts or leasing counterparts. Uh, um, and to make to keep this transition real, um, I think optimizing the e-bus project operations will be key. So digitization is going to play a major role uh, in electric bus projects. Uh, uh, a success and uh, moving from pilot to uh, scale. Um, so uh, it's essential uh, for all the transit agencies or authorities to keep that in mind uh, at the, from the very beginning of the project. 
projects. And secondly, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the pace is uh, uh, of the transition is equally important. So governments, authorities, cities, and all the stakeholders need to think about uh, unique approaches where administrative uh, processes, administrative costs, uh, like for example, Vinencia mentioned the project was tendered in 2020 or 2021 and got operated, uh, started its operation in late 2022. It's a big administrative cost, which all the parties, including private sector, government agencies, uh, even uh, the subsidy providing organizations or departments which put in. We need to identify ways to reduce this administrative costs uh, as well as the time. Um, like, for example, maybe approaches in India, um, aggregation, um, which, which could be possibly one of these answers. So, uh, yeah, we need to find innovative approaches to cut down the pace and uh, digitization is key as well. So thanks. I'll leave it there. Amazing. Thank you all so much. I just want to like take everything that you said and, and pull it together in just a really quick summary. Um, I think it's really interesting that targets can help like lead the the innovation and the discussion and really get people aligned. Um, and that this is a moment to really think about the people behind the systems and around the systems and how this transition is impacting their lives um, and how we can use this transition for inclusivity to increase inclusivity, but also to to reinforce how we can make lives better, uh, cleaner, quieter, more sustainable, uh, less time traveled. All of these things are amazing impacts that are had that, that we're seeing on the lives of people. And ultimately, as Harry wrote in the uh, comment, that that's what this is about. It, it, it's about people and the planet. So very excited to have this conversation. Um, and the transition is real. So hopefully we can keep going with that. And Ivana, I'll pass it to you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for the excellent webinar. I learned a lot personally. I have a deep love for eBuses uh, since working for ITDP and, 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 and really beyond. Um, so really great to see everyone staying with us beyond the time and until the end of the session. Uh, thank you to all the panelists, um, Rohan, Diogo, Vinencia, and of course, Emma for moderating. Um, and thank you audience for attending and also sharing your language interpretation uh, preferences for future webinars. There's still a link to vote there. It gives us um, a great input. Um, and I also wanted to mention the next webinar on October 4th um, in our Sustainable Transport Award uh, webinar series. It will be a keynote address with the winner of the STA, uh, the City of Paris, France, um, and the link is already in the chat box. So with that, I really, again, wanted to thank everyone for this amazing webinar and hope to see you again soon. I wish we had thank more you. time. It was so great. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Diego, Benente, and Rohan. It was amazing. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.